thank you, brethren. I've benefited from all of the messages from Dr. Walters and Dr. Much. I've learned in those messages there has been both fire and water, unction and the content of the word, fire and water, and I've benefited. That was a tender and masterful message this morning from Dr. Much. Powerful and heartwarming. And I'll never forget it. Thank you, sir. It's a privilege to be here. Let's take our Bibles, please. Turn to Psalm 131. Psalm 131. Psalm 131. Verse 1. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Bible students tell us that children in Bible times were weaned between the age of two and three. I cannot speak with certainty, but that's what commentators tell us, that in Bible times, children were weaned between the age of two and three. With the help of the Lord and your prayerful attention, which I strongly need, I'm going to preach both now and in my next message on a temptation, an issue with which I have struggled for all of my 69 years. I have struggled with this for all of my 69 years. And it may be that some of you have struggled with the same thing. Psalm 131 is the twelfth of the fifteen songs of degrees, or songs of ascent. The Holy Spirit used King David to write it. Some have referred to the fifteen songs of degrees as the little psalter within the larger psalter. Some see this as a special unit the little psalter within the larger psalter. This little psalter, these 15 songs, were used for worship as the Hebrews ascended up to the temple in Jerusalem at their feasts. I call this little psalter the 15 steps to joy. They're going up to Jerusalem and the temple, and they're singing at least some of these 15 steps to joy as they go up to the temple to worship. For the next several messages, I'll preach on this subject. Joy in quieting, tamping down ambition. Joy in quieting Tamping down ambition. Our text is verse 2. The first two sections. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. Or you could think of the message in this term. 
Joy in restraining ambition. Of all the ways the human soul can find joy, this is perhaps one of the most difficult ways to implement. Contrary to what the self-esteem movement advocates, there is not a one of us that is not born esteeming himself, his abilities, his rightness, and his potential with special emphasis on the word potential. I will rephrase that. The Bible teaches that we all are born esteeming ourselves, our abilities, our rightness, and our potential. That's the way we're all born. Freud and his crowd are wrong. That's uh, secular humanism. We're all born esteeming our worth and our abilities and our potential. Even self-pity is an indication of high esteem. (laughs) Even self-pity is an indication of high self-esteem. I pity myself because I think I am more and deserve more. So I wallow in self-pity as an indication of how highly I esteem myself and what I should be getting from God and life. There are numerous verses in Scripture that clearly indicate that we are not born with a tendency to low self-esteem, but rather with a tendency to high self-esteem and its accompanying selfish ambition. Now, please do not misunderstand. I am not advocating laziness in life or laziness in the ministry. We need to work hard. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. I'm not advocating laziness. I'm rather saying that David came to the place where he realized that joy is to be found in working hard to bring glory to God, while sadness, empty, unfulfilled sadness, is to be found in working hard to bring glory to self. The Scottish Covenanters were courageous, strong believers, who often paid for their loyalty to simple New Testament faith in Christ with their very lives. And the Scottish Covenanters became known as the Christians who were jealous for the crown rights of King Jesus. They were not jealous for their own imagined rights. They were known for being jealous of the crown rights of King Jesus. And only when we're jealous for the crown rights of King Jesus will we know true, lasting joy. As long as we're jealous for our own crown rights, we'll be sad, unhappy, and always looking around the corner. Too often we are jealous and animated by causes far smaller and less consequential than King Jesus. The New Testament firmly establishes the sad reality of an unrestrained, unchecked, inordinate ambition for self. Self's cause and self's glory. The Apostle Paul especially chronicles both the subtle and not so subtle drive for the kingdom of self. We all have it. And under inspiration, Paul chronicles this drive for the kingdom of self. Let's hear now from Paul and sense that one of the greatest enemies of missionary church planting is an unquieted, unchecked ambition for self. The subject comes up so often in the Apostle Paul's letters to the churches. Let's start in 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Turn there with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. 
Let no man seek his own. Now that's a masculine pronoun there. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. The word wealth refers to welfare or well-being. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth or well-being. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 13, 5. Charity, love, doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Welcome to the club, ladies. That's a female. This is the lady thing too, ladies. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. And then come to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Philippians 2, 3. Here, Paul writes, let nothing be done through strife or vain, empty glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let nothing be done through vain glory, but let each esteem other better than themselves. Our Lord himself is the perfect illustration of good ambition. In John chapter 2, would you turn there please? John chapter 2. We will see that our Lord is the perfect example of good ambition. John 2, 13. John 2, 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and as an obedient, loyal Hebrew, he would have been singing one or more of the 15 psalms of degrees as he went up to Jerusalem for the feast. Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Now this was an ambitious, demanding task. This was an ambitious, demanding task. There's nothing namby-pamby about this. This took intestinal fortitude. This act of cleansing his father's temple was surely not false, pacifistic, laissez-faire humility, in quotes, that dared to cleanse the temple of large animals and strong, entrenched purveyors of blatant sacrilege. This was an ambitious task. But what made this temple cleansing ambition good ambition? What made it good ambition? What made this temple cleansing ambition good ambition was the motive behind it. And we see the motive in the next verse. Verse 17. And as Jesus had finished doing this, his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And that is what reveals the motive in the heart and mind of our Lord as he undertook this ambition. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And of course, our Lord quoted again, from David, David in Psalm 69, 9, and the Lord said, this is why I did this. The ambition of Jesus was always for God the Father. His will, his work, his temple, and his glory. It wasn't about himself. I come to do thy will, O Lord, in the volume of the book it is written. 
His ambition was always good ambition because it was always, always for the Father. In John 17, 4, Jesus could say with perfect satisfaction and contentment, Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I finished the work which thou gavest me. It wasn't about his own image or his own agenda. It was always about the glory of the Father. And when Jesus was hanging on the cross in John 19, 30, he cried, to Telestai. And the word comes from the Greek verb, Dilios. He said, it is finished. What was finished? Doing the will of the Father for the glory of the Father to the nth degree. It's done. I've done it all in the name of the Father and for the glory of the Father. It's done. This is the illustration of good ambition. And for the most part, but I sadly say, not all of his life, not all of his life, but for the most of his life, David also lived like a weaned child for the same God and the same God-glorifying ambition. Now, in the next message, we will sadly, for just a few moments, in order to be truthful to the record, we will look at some of the situations where David violated his own Psalm 131 precepts, where he was not like a weaned child, when he did not live for the glory of God, but where he lived for himself. We'll get to that in the next message. But speaking of David and how he usually lived, as a weaned child for the glory of God. How ironic it is that David's own son Solomon provides perhaps the most glaring illustration of bad ambition. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes 2. Ecclesiastes 2. And I want us to have a responsive reading. And so if your health permits, only if your health permits, would you stand with me? I want us to get into this passage and see how David's own son Solomon is a prime example of bad ambition. We're going to read Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 11. And I'll begin in 4, and we'll all read verse 11 when we get there. I'm starting in Ecclesiastes 2, 4, and Solomon is... Speaking and writing, I made me great works, I built in me houses, I planted me vineyards. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I gathered me also silver and gold, and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments, and that of all sorts. So I was great, and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. I also made wisdom remain with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Thank you. Please be seated. I acknowledge, I acknowledge that Solomon makes passing reference to his wisdom. 
here. I acknowledge that. But I would say that the wisdom that he refers to must be a qualified wisdom as we see the end of the thing in verse 11. He says, I retain my wisdom. But it was a certain kind of wisdom and, and certainly not the best kind of wisdom for he ends up a very unhappy man in verse 11. Verse 11, the last word on the subject, indicates that the joy of verse 10 was a strange kind of joy. He says, I kept my wisdom and I experienced all these joys and yet in the very next verse he says, it was vanity. I was frustrated. I had vexation. That is a very strange kind of joy that leaves a man sad. And that's exactly what happened to Solomon. At least in this portion of his life, Solomon is a pathetic example of bad ambition. The words I, my, me, and mine occur 33 or 34 times in eight verses of Scripture. What Solomon did in this segment of his life was all about himself. He was the center of his universe. How sad that the son of David at this time in Ecclesiastes was not weaned from the haughtiness, the lofty look, the greatness and the high things that David said he'd been weaned of in Psalm 131. Solomon was certainly not weaned from haughtiness and great imaginations here in Ecclesiastes. It would be about 300 years before Jeremiah would pose a question to a loyal friend and scribe, Barak, that described where Solomon was both wrong and unweaned. Jeremiah would ask Barak, And seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. That was the problem with Solomon. Jeremiah 45, 5. Good ambition is embodied in John the Baptist's statements regarding Jesus. John the Baptist said, He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He must increase, but I must decrease. And you and I will never be happy should we stay in gospel ministry for 50 years until that is the case in our lives where we have quieted our own innate uh, natural ambition and rest with God as a weaned child. We will never be content. We'll never have joy till we're weaned from selfish, inordinate ambition. Bad ambition is personified in our Lord's parable about the rich fool. Turn to Luke 12. Luke 12, verse 16. Luke 12, 16. And Jesus spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. It should be starting to sound a lot like Solomon. The personal pronouns are here. This should sound a lot like Solomon. This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my Soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God, but God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself. There's that bad motivation again, that self-centered motivation. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Bad 
unquieted, unweaned. Ambition is toward and about self. Bad ambition is completely self-excited. And I do not know whether you can join me today in acknowledging or confessing that it's positively embarrassing how much time we spend thinking about ourselves. Would you be transparent? Would you acknowledge your humanity and just say it's embarrassing how much time I spend thinking about myself and what would be good for me and what I would like. By contrast, good ambition, weaned, quiet, quieted ambition is no longer thrashing about, thrashing about on the bosom, good ambition is quieted. It's weaned. It's not always thrashing about and searching, searching, searching for what will please me. It's content. It's weaned. Good ambition is little or small. Good ambition is little or small about itself. Do you remember what the kingmaker Judge Samuel had to say to King Saul, whose ambition had become perverted? Oh, the account of Saul is so sad. He starts out low profile. He starts out slinking back. But he doesn't finish that way. And Samuel told Saul, when thou was little, when thou was little in thine own sight, wast thou not made head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed the king over Israel. But the king Saul's ambition became perverted. And we need not answer the question. Was he ever saved? I cannot emphatically answer that question. There are good Bible scholars on both sides of the question. I do know at one point the Bible says God gave him another heart. Perhaps that was simply an equipping for all the challenges of the, the kingship. But there is, there is a degrading, there's a downward spiral in the life of King Saul. And so Samuel said, when you were little, God could use you, but not anymore. When you were like a weaned child, that was good ambition, but you've become a great big bundle of self-oriented bad ambition, and your ministry and your leadership is done, finished, over. I speak to myself and our son, our son, has told me, and he's told others that he's praying that I will finish well. That's our son's dominant prayer for me, that I will finish well. Dr. Much encouraged us to read biographies and autobiographies, and I completely concur with that recommendation. And how sad it is, whether it down on paper with ink, or whether it's just word of mouth, and we either read or hear of the life of one who for a time had good, God-glorifying ambition. But then we see it on the page, or we hear it. Something went wrong! And what seemed to be good, God-glorifying ambition becomes skewed and perverted. And it all becomes about me, my little kingdom. How sad. And sometimes the wheels keep grinding. 
but astute, discerning people to say something has changed. The sermons are the same. The demeanor is the same. But something has become skewed or perverted. It's no longer about Jesus. It's about something lesser than King Jesus and his glory. Amy Carmichael, missionary for a brief time to Japan, and then lifetime missionary after that to India, wrote a poem entitled, My Prayer. And I need to pray this prayer for me. And I ask you to consider praying this prayer for you. Amy Carmichael said, And shall I pray thee, change thy will, my Father, until it be according to mine? But no, Lord, no, that shall never be. Rather, I pray thee, blend my human will with thine, and work in me to will and to do thy pleasure. Let all within me, peaceful, reconciled, tarry content, my well-beloved's leisure, at last, at last, like a weaned child. Are you there yet? I don't say that I'm completely there yet, but that's where I want to be, dwelling content at the last, like a weaned Joy in quieted ambition. Dr. Beale, would you come?